What's going on, y'all? There's only one week left in the season. Let's take a look at the best decks to climb in Marvel Snap. I think it's only fair that we start here. The metagame dynamics of Marvel Snap at the highest levels in recent weeks have been shifting a great deal. I think a week ago I was down on Loki and I may have been wrong about that. I think this week I'm very high on Loki because of the changes in those dynamics. The basic thing that's happening is Annihilus Cannonball Profex decks have become the sort of deck du jour at the top end of the metagame. Annihilus is a very powerful card, Cannonball is a very powerful card when you have a Professor X, all of this clog stuff sort of goes together, and there's this sort of nexus of decks playing either Century Annihilus or Cannonball Profex or all of those cards. And when you have a situation like that, one of the decks that really starts to shine in response is a deck like Loki, because it is very difficult to beat your deck, but cheaper when you are not playing something like Mobius, when you are playing all of these sort of oddball type cards that need specific situations in order to get set up. Now, that's not to say this is a 100% win against any of those decks in any real way, but it is probably the best of the Angela decks in terms of dealing with what the Annihilus decks are doing. If I had to guess at a metagame triangle, I would say it would be something along the lines of Loki beats the Annihilus stuff, the Annihilus Profex stuff beats Combo, and Combo still beats Loki. Make no mistake, if Loki ends up becoming the dominant deck, or if really any Angela deck ends up becoming the dominant deck, the way to beat that is going to be with cards like Hela, cards like Phoenix Force, which for now have sort of fallen a little bit off out of the metagame. The reason for this is not necessarily due to their inherent power, but because when you have enough bad matchups in a metagame and you are playing a fundamentally less consistent deck than your opponents, which all the combo decks are sort of by definition, you end up in a situation where it just ends up not being super profitable to play something like Hela or Phoenix Force. Other combo decks are being forced out of the metagame by more mundane concerns. Mr. Negative being forced out just by people playing Clog. The Living Tribunal being forced out by the same dynamic, right? The decks that can try to survive that are Hela and Phoenix Force. They don't do it particularly well, but they are still good enough to beat Loki, which gives them some real utility in a metagame where I think it's reasonable to say the best deck probably is Loki. I believe four of the top five players in the world on ladder right now are playing Loki to some degree, some almost to the exclusion of anything else. This is an extremely powerful deck if you are able to actually utilize it to its full potential. But don't worry, this is not a Loki meta. It just sort of finally circled around to a point where this deck actually makes a ton of sense again. The real struggle I had was trying to figure out exactly which Cannonball, Pixie, Annihilus, you know, which of these sort of Cannonball soup decks, which of these Annihilus soup decks I showed. So we're just going to go through all of them that I've seen recently, that I've played recently, and talk about what their upsides and downsides are compared to the other decks in their niche. We're going to start with the one that is likely most familiar to the viewers of this channel. This is the Beavis and Butthead deck. It's a very straightforward deck that is attempting to leverage Mockingbird in addition to the typical Annihilus Cannonball Profex stuff, and it's very straightforward in that context. You're really just trying to do the things every deck is trying to do right now, and you're playing a bit of a good card soup in so doing. What this deck is really trying to do is dig deep on 5 plus 1 plays, so obviously you're looking at, you know, Mockingbird as a 1 or a 0 when you can get it. That's going to be bigger than your opponent's 1 or a 0. You have things like Cannonball to absolutely win lanes. And the basic thing this deck is trying to do on a fundamental level is play a sort of Eliath style game plan with Cannonball, where what you're attempting to do is clog one lane, have it be 1, whether that be by Professor X or Annihilus stuff, you just have that lane 1. And then you win another lane with Cannonball, because hopefully you're behind on priority. You play like Cannonball and a Demon. You play Cannonball and a Mockingbird. You can't play Cannonball, a Mockingbird, and a Demon. And when you're not doing your sort of, oh, I instantly win the game stuff, you're doing a bunch of other very powerful stuff too. There's really not a lot of bad things in this deck that you can reasonably be doing. So I think this is a good example to sort of illustrate what the sort of Cannonball soup side of the metagame can really start to look like. 
Cannonball soup has a lot of different forms, right? The one major ingredient you need is cannonball, and then you really just need ways to fill up lanes and guarantee that you're going to win them. And so you can take that a whole bunch of different directions. This one's not even playing Annihilus. We're using Dr. Octopus. We're using magic to make sure that we have even more time with our opponent drained on resources. There's just a lot going on here, right? Like this section of the metagame is by far the most uh, movable section of the metagame. There's so much movement happening in terms of people optimizing and trying to figure out what the best way to use this type of strategy is. But the fundamentals, like most Cannonball decks, remain the same. Your job is to going into the final turn, have a lane that you have won, and then not have priority, and then play Cannonball and some stuff with power, and then they are gone. You cannot lose those games. The only way you lose those games is like they play Eliath on you, which is a, a kind of a funny turnaround, right? That Eliath is the counterplay to new Eliath, but... This is a strong deck doing strong things in a strong and growing sector of the metagame. And I think the fact that there are so many iterations on this cannonball concept is really a testament to his power. This list was cooked up by KX4N. Uh, and I know he's not the first person to be like, oh, we should play, you know, uh, Mockingbird in our, you know, Killmonger, Squirrel Girl death deck. He's not the first person to do that. I know that for a fact. But the interesting thing about this is it demonstrates the just sort of overwhelming power of Century Annihilus. Like, this is effectively destroy, but we're taking out the sort of linear destroy stuff in favor of just being a Annihilus midrange deck instead. And I think, again, like, this is a real testament to just like, oh man, this is a really strong thing to be doing. And I know you're going to be like, oh, well, there's no cannonball in here. It's like, you know, again... I'm not really sure how to discern these decks from each other. Are the Annihilus decks meaningfully distinct from the Cannonball decks, or are they all sort of doing the same type of thing? To me, I think they're all sort of doing the same type of thing, and so they're sort of in the same grouping for me. This is a deck that is saying, you know what, I think that the typical tools Destroy has are not suited to deal with a metagame full of Professor X Cannonball, I would much prefer to be using different tools, using cheap cards like Death, getting our ability to really vomit power onto the board in a meaningful way online early, and not being reliant on things like Deadpool for the power in this deck, but instead playing a little bit more of a small ball game plan where we're in more games using more generically powerful cards, rather than saying, you know, some of the time I'm going to have, you know, 70 power on the final turn of the game, and it's not really super relevant in a cannonball meta, unfortunately. So you end up in a situation where you want to be ahead going into those turns or being winnable, have those games be winnable, even when your opponent is playing cannonball, which means you're going to want to play a lot of, like, big stuff and get it on the board and not be in a situation where you can lose to cannonball and clean up your opponent's clog cards and, you know, have Lady Deathstrike and Annihilus so that you don't end up getting filled up and those lanes don't become unwinnable for you. And that really puts them in a situation where it makes it a little bit more difficult to Professor X. Like, you kind of see where I'm going with this and what this deck is trying to do. This is effectively anti-clog clog club. We're playing a little bit of clog, but what we're really trying to do is beat up on the other people doing this. The OG of decks maybe being carried by Professor X Cannonball is, of course, Mill. And uh, it's still actually pretty good. Like, this is a deck that I think people maybe sort of think of as like, oh, it's like a bad thing. But I think one thing that has become very clear to me recently is it is very difficult to have a bad deck with Professor X Cannonball. It's just a very difficult thing to do. You end up getting just so many absolutely free wins when you play stuff like this. And I think that's a, you know, not necessarily the greatest thing of all time. I would not be shocked, honestly, if they ended up getting Cannonball a little bit in like an upcoming patch or OTA. My thought process is I feel like this guy could lose like a solid two points of power and still probably be like a fine card. I do think he's like a lot more interesting than Eliath is. Like, I think I've been sort of flippantly referring to him as Eliath 2. And I don't think that's particularly fair. He just has like a similar role. Uh, but being five cost does mean that I think he could stand to lose some power. Like, I, I think it's a reasonable role to want filled in Marvel Snap as like the sort of finisher that goes alongside maybe Prof X. But if people just have like proven to hate that kind of dynamic, I get it.
I just think that I haven't seen nearly as many complaints about this guy as I have about Eliath, which means it might actually just be something about Eliath specifically that people hated, like the total invalidation of your cards. And uh, I think Cannonball specifically requires just a lot more work to be put in, because if you're not clogging those lanes, he's not actually doing anything. If you're not locking those other lanes down, he's not actually all that good. So you need to put in all the work to lock it down. And where Eliath would just like, just like, it didn't even matter what you did on the other lanes. It was just like, oh, well, you don't do anything. So I think, I think on the whole, he's like a significantly more balanced Eliath that people are jumping through hoops to get into the same situation as Eliath. And I think that's probably a good thing. But this deck is doing that exact thing, right? Like we're going to jump through all the hoops to make sure that this card is as strong of a finisher as it can be. We are going to play good stats on curve. We have not just Cannonball, but also Shang-Chi in terms of answering what your opponent is trying to do. There's just a ton going for you when you play a deck like this. Now, the fact that you're playing a mill strategy, it's not great, but you're not playing a ton of bad cards in service of the mill strategy. You're playing good stats in Baron Zemo. You're playing Gladiator. Like It's not like you're playing Yondu or anything like that. And you still are a Cannonball Profex deck, especially with Daredevil in there, with White Widow in there. You have some real ability to clog. You have some real ability to make it so that Cannonball actually is going to win these lanes. And you also just get to play a pretty normal curve out game of Marvel Snap. I recommend this deck for people who just want to curve out. Here's where we're going to start bridging over into the Angela section. This is, of course, a deck cooked up by Safety Blade that I actually had a pretty good win rate with. I'm not saying you need to go out of your way to craft havoc for this. This is just sort of a an example of the direction that these sort of Cannonball Profex decks could go, which is to say you can hybridize this with the Angela Hope stuff too, and then you have not just Angela Hope as a primary game plan, but Cannonball Profex as a finisher, and it worked out pretty well for me. Havoc on 5 enables you to play Cannonball anyway, and he's basically a 2-8 in that situation. When you have a Hope Summers, you end up not feeling any tax from Havoc at all because he's a 2-8 and you still have your normal, if not higher, amount of energy in a deck like this. And in addition, you have Ravona Renslayer to discount stuff like Havoc. So sometimes he's a 1-8 and you're just, you're really not feeling any downside risk at all with playing a card like that. Is this necessarily the best iteration of the Angela plus Cannonball Profex thing possible? No, but it is the one I've played and it is the one I was successful with. I don't know for a fact this is the absolute top of the line Angela plus Cannonball deck, but I think it does represent an important sort of fusion in the general direction of the game, right? Like we've had Angela plus Annihilus decks. We haven't really had Angela plus Profex decks. And I think that's an interesting direction to take this for sure. As far as other Angela decks go, I mean, it's it's definitely a compelling thing to do. You're like, oh, right. That's a really good combo. That is cards we can play. Let's throw that in our deck of just really good cards, right? And I do think there is, you know, I think people might get sick of Marvel Snap being like, ah, here are the 12 best cards, and here's my little unique twist on the 12 best card shell. And it's like, yeah, to some degree, that is what's happening. I can't really argue with that. Like, when you look at all the decks we just talked about in the sort of Annihilus, Cannonball, Profex, Nexus of the metagame, it is hard to argue that they're not just like, here's the, the baseline of the deck, and then here's just like some cards we play around that to make the baseline stuff more functional. I, I get that. And so I am excited to see Annihil or to see Profex Cannonball being put in a sort of different type of shell, but I am sensitive to the idea that this is still just a good cards deck, right? I still think Shuri Kitty is really good. I don't really know why people stopped playing this deck in, in reasonable numbers. Like right now, I think the biggest reason is probably Cannonball, but it's like, you know, I genuinely do think that this deck is doing powerful stuff. I think it's not super well positioned in a Cannonball Profex meta, but it is a strong deck. And it's also the kind of deck that can win a lane that has like a void in it and to have that just not really be a problem at all. I do think that it's likely, if not possible, that there are better iterations of the Angela sort of combo thing that we're trying to do here, right? I'm not convinced this is better than Loki. I'm not convinced this is better than, say, even the Profex Cannonball stuff in here, but it is a genuinely playable deck that I think people have sort of forgotten about as like, oh, you know, that's, you can't play this. I do think the major issue it has, though, is the Profex Cannonball stuff, because what we've noticed in the metagame overall is there's less Shang-Chi, and that is good for a deck like this, 
but there's a lot of turn five, the game is over, turn six, it doesn't matter how big the guy you play is. And this deck is sort of predicated on big guy turn five, big guy turn six, ha 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 ha. And so even though Shang-Chi is, I think, more poorly positioned than he has been in a while, this deck still ends up running into some cannonball profex issues in a in an unpleasant way some of the time when it invests in the Shuri game plan. So what happens when you don't invest in the Shuri game plan? I mean, you end up at something a little bit closer to this, which is just like the normal move deck, right? And I think people sort of think that this deck is like passe or not at the level that it needs to be. But this is a deck whose real bad matchup was actually mostly just combo decks. And there's a lot less combo decks right now. And it's really not as bad into the Professor X stuff as you'd think. Like, it's not as good into Profex stuff as stuff that is built with Profex in mind, but I definitely think that this is a little bit of an underrated deck right now. I know people are going to ask, do I need Red Hulk for this? No, you can absolutely replace Red Hulk with Magneto. After the nerf, I think it's possible Magneto is even better than Red Hulk. Like, a, this is a, a, a good card, Red Hulk, but it's not like uh, make or break on this archetype in, in this context, I think. This is a solid genuinely good mid-range deck that you can leverage skill differential with, you can play a lot of stuff into, and for the decks that are leveraging just Profex, Miss Marvel is phenomenally good. If you are not getting clogged, like a lot of these decks are cutting, like they're skimming on actual clog, right? You're not like there are decks that are playing, you know, Annihilus Hood Sentry, but you can beat that by filling up the right lane, right? Like, there are decks that are playing that stuff, but a lot of decks are also cutting that stuff. And if you're just a Profex deck, you are gonna feel the pain of a Miss Marvel, I think, a lot of the time. She is very good. When I talk about decks that are built to beat Profex or built with Profex in mind, this is kind of the thing I'm talking about. Like decks that are built in the last week or so really have this sort of Annihilus, Profex, Cannonball metagame in their minds when they're being built. And this is a deck that is definitely of that nature, where it is playing cards specifically for that metagame and specifically in a way to target that metagame. So this is effectively, as weird as it may seem, this is effectively Sarah Control. But what it's trying to do is be Sarah Control without the issues that are caused by doing something like actually playing Sarah. You want early scalers if you want to try to beat Professor X. So both of the Thors, Thor and Beta Ray Bill, are excellent at doing that. Jane Foster, of course, draws you all your cards. She is effectively your Sarah, right? Because instead of discounting your stuff, allowing you to play more stuff, she's just giving you like a 06 and a 07, which gives you a sort of Sarah-like point explosion alongside your tech, which is Quake, which is Shadow King, which is Shang-Chi. And then you have this additional point slam on top of it while also not being super vulnerable to the incredible amount of Profex Cannonball and Annihilus in the metagame. Now, Annihilus specifically bears a special mention because we are playing Lady Deathstrike almost entirely because of that card. This is a, we are playing Lady Deathstrike so we don't lose those right lanes to Sentry Voids. That is the entire point of it because this deck is not built to be able to fill up that right lane the way another deck can. When you compare this to, say, the Angela Move deck we just talked about, that deck can fill up that right lane and not really feel all that bad about it. This deck is playing one card on turn two, one card on turn three, one card on turn four, one card on turn five. And usually, if everything is going right, the card you play on three and the card you play on four should never be in the same lane. That's a problem. Oftentimes, you're playing a card on three, a card on four, a card on five, and you want none of them in the same lane. So you need a way to deal with Annihilus. That is your way. And so when I say this deck is built for an Annihilus Profex Cannonball metagame, that's what I mean. It's, a, it's an attempt at playing an old school style of Sarah control without the inherent weaknesses to Profex Annihilus, to cannonball the kind of stuff that's just like oh man i cannot beat that if i'm playing something that doesn't have the scalers the way the thor deck does tlsg is back playing marvel snap and i tracked down the recent proliferation of like gene gray spectrum decks to his channel and it turns out that he was the one who posted the original version of this deck i'm about two cards off from him 
Uh, there's a Sarah in here, and there's a Shang-Chi in there. His original version was a U.S. agent build. I figured it was a better idea to show the non-U.S. agent build, because I kind of think nobody has that card right now. But it's fine if you want to play the other build, too. I think that's probably just as good. I looked at the numbers, and this build had uh, higher numbers at a lower sample size on Untapped than the U.S. agent build in Top 10% Infinite, which sort of swung my decision towards this one. Personally, I'm not 100% sold on either of these builds. I think that the major issue I feel like they run into is very specifically the card Loki, because you're trying to do like a fairly fair thing when you play a deck like this, and the card Loki is just really good into that, and so I think there is going to be some, de some desire for this deck to be like, okay, we need a Mobius now, we need to deal with that kind of stuff. But when you start doing that, you end up playing like a 3-3, you lose a little bit of the real power upside, and it just gets a little bit awkward, I think. I personally think these decks are pretty solid. Like, they're as good as they've ever been, I would say, because of the ways in which you can just sort of really jam up Profex Cannonball strategies. When I talk about Profex Cannonball as like the thing the meta rotates around, that's really what's happening here. You can really jam that stuff up especially with something like Cosmo. Like, people talk about, oh, there's no way to beat Cannonball. Cosmo can do that. Jean Grey locking it into one location can do that. Like, I do think that while this deck does have a Loki problem that probably caps it, it is a stronger deck than people give it credit for. And I think whether you're playing US Agent or Shang-Chi, whether you're playing Omega Red or Sarah, I think whatever it is you're doing is mostly going to be uh, relatively similar power. Now, that said, I do actually, I have been very impressed with US Agent. Like, I get it. I cut it for Shang-Chi. It's Shang-Chi. Sure, I get it. You know, it's, not, it's hard for that to be bad. But I will say, US Agent's like a 2-7. Like, a two seven. like, that's pretty good when you can make that happen. Especially when Jean Grey is making sure stuff gets played in that lane. If they're not a kitty deck, they're playing big stuff in that lane. They have to. And so this deck really has some real, like, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to play Jean Grey. They're not going to be able to annihilate Sentry us. They're going to play Sentry. We play uh, Cosmo before they annihilate it. They have to play the annihilate in that lane. Like, there's a bunch of cool stuff that can really happen with this deck. And I think that it's a little bit underrated. But at the same time, I am not a fan of the Loki matchup at all. And that is a problem. Credit to Phoenix Force for being one of the few combo decks that can really try to adapt to different metagames. Like, it can't do it overwhelmingly successfully, but it can try. And what it's doing to combat this Professor X Cannonball metagame is Living Tribunal, which is a card that can allow it to not get completely owned by the things that those decks are doing. One of the things about the Prof X Cannonball decks is they don't have the world's highest point output. It honestly is not all that high, because you don't need the world's highest point output when you are winning one lane with Professor X and winning another lane with Cannonball, the total number of points almost becomes a little bit irrelevant. One of the ways to try to attack this is with this card. Living Tribunal can let you win those Prof X lanes that you're maybe like a couple points off in. It's, again, it's not the most reliable way of doing this. It's not like I would say, okay, this is perfect, we have solved the meta, Phoenix Force is now a great deck again. But it is one of the few combo decks that is not directly linear enough that it can actually try to adapt in a real way. And I think that I do want to give it credit for that. I think if I had to play a combo deck right now, this would be the combo deck. And that is a good thing for this archetype. Because not only does it have, you know, built-in destroy stuff to deal with the clog people, it has the ability to try to combat Professor X with Living Tribunal, like, of all the combo decks, this is the one that is by far the least poorly positioned, where decks like Mr. Negative or Living Tribunal just fold to getting clogged. You just can't win because of the way they're trying to do things. This deck can beat that, and it can also deal with Professor X. Not amazingly well, but it can, and that's important. I genuinely do not think Hela is well positioned right now. I think this metagame has moved away from this deck making a ton of sense. However... It's on here because in a world where a bunch of people watch this and they're like, huh, you know what I need to do is start playing Loki to beat up on these Annihilus Cannonball Profex decks? Hell is really good against that. <laughs> the Annihilus Cannonball Profex decks, specifically the Cannonball Profex part of that, are really what's keeping Hella from being elite again. And if everyone just goes back to playing Angela decks, 
yeah, no, this deck is gonna farm. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but it is something to keep an eye out on where like it is very much being held back right now by the power of Profex Cannonball, by the power, like really it's, it's kind of a lot of Profex, right? Like Profex Annihilus, interestingly enough, because the way it works is Profex just wins one lane. You get like two clogs on another lane and it's like, they really need to get lucky to beat you on that clog lane. Like, if you're able to do the Profex into, like, you know, all right, final turn, I'm going to have priority because they're a hella deck. I'm going to send over a hood in a sentry. And it's just like, oh, okay, I guess I guess I lose that lane too. But I think Hella is the kind of deck that, like, if Loki ever does, because it's time for Loki, right? Like, let's be real about this. Valentina is about to come out, which means it probably is going to be time for Loki, which means it's probably going to be time for Hella. I talked about the Thor's deck being built with Profex Cannonball in mind, and I wanted to highlight another deck being built on the sort of same axis here, although I do think it's very likely, at least to me, that the Thor's deck just kind of does it better. The idea with this deck is that we're just going to have so many things that scale late in the game that it's impossible to Professor X us, and I think this is a pretty compelling thing to do. There's also a Killmonger in here, because one of the major things that all of these Annihilus decks do is they go like turn one hood, turn two demon a lot, and if you can play a Killmonger on that, it's basically like 15 power. Like, these Annihilus decks are very confident and just like, there's no downside in me playing the hood. There is a downside, I'm going to kill it with a Killmonger out of a deck you don't expect. And I think that that is just sort of an example of how people have to start thinking about this metagame. It's not necessarily like, this is an unbeatable tier 1 strategy. It's more like there are specific conditions that you have to fulfill. And one of them is have some scalers, make those Professor X's harder to hit. Another one is just take away the fact that they're going to clog you up with a hood. Just get rid of the hood. Get rid of the demon. Play a guy. Get rid of it. Wow. Mashed my uh, mic there. Sorry. And I think that kind of stuff is a good example of how to play a sort of older school deck, an older style deck, and adapt it to a current metagame. So shout out to Mickey for doing this. The baseline pixie stuff is still around, but it feels like it's been mostly supplanted by people doing more straightforward Cannonball Profex, Annihilus Sentry things, as opposed to this. Like, there was a pixie in the Beavis and Butthead deck originally, and it sort of just eventually left the deck, right? I do think there is a chance that this deck ends up in a better spot going forward, though, because one thing that a deck built like this does is beat the crap out of Loki just because it plays Mobius naturally. And again, we're heading into a world where I already think Loki is probably the best deck. Valentina is coming out, and we need to be prepared for what that may bring. The Stefan Supergiant deck is still 100% playable, but I do think that after the video I did with Stefan, it's become a little bit more understandable, right? Like what'll happen is you'll be playing against it and then you'll be like, oh, this is the part where they go Cosmo Negasonic. I know what happens here and I know how to beat it. And I think that uh, a lot of the sort of mystery has been taken out of this deck, which is to say, this is a deck that was really catching people by surprise, not just in terms of what they were doing, but how they were doing it. And I think that it has been sort of dragged a little bit back down. That said, uh, this deck is actually still good. Like. For those who are hearing this and thinking, oh, it was just a gimmick deck, a surprise deck, that's not true. This is a deck that has a metagame level power, straight up. It was better than that because of the surprise. But even now that people know the tricks, this is still a damn good deck. Long-term viewers of the channel will be familiar with the Zoo Delusion Meter, wherein I rate how delusional I am about Zoo being a good deck finally. However, however... However, Zoo is a good deck, finally, kind of. I think this is at least worthy of an honorable mention. It has good stats on untapped. I've been playing against it in Top Infinite. I have lost to this deck. It's sort of similar to the KX4N, like, anti-clog clog club deck, where, like, a lot of what this is really doing is just saying, like, look, okay, I'm going to play some really cheap Mockingbirds. I'm going to play some really cheap Cull Obsidians. I'm going to have some tech against what you're trying to do. And it's a little more proactive in that sense. Like, it's looking to say, like, all right, I'm going to Cosmo your Annihilus rather than anything else. I think there are probably better executions of this concept or, like, more focused executions of this concept on the tier list, by which I mean things that are directly more relevant to the metagame right now. But look, if Zoo is a playable deck, I'm going to honorable mention it. You kind of just have to be used to that by now.
These videos just keep getting longer and longer thanks to the preponderance of, I don't even know what to call it, five drop soup? Like, Cannonball Profex Annihilus Century. That's a, that's a sector of the metagame that is growing enormously right now. As far as future predictions, I mean, here's, you want to know what my secret Valentina prediction is? I'm just going to let you know now. Um, Loki's already really good. Valentina's going to come out and people are going to be like, wow, Valentina made Loki busted. And it's like, no, 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 no. Loki did that. That's my prediction for Valentina. We're going to have to find out, though, because I think, I mean, I think Loki's already probably the best deck. If I had to, like, name a best deck, I would probably name that. I probably wouldn't play it. I'd probably be, like, looking to try to figure out, you know, like, the Cannonball Profex Sentry. Uh, that kind of stuff is where I would want to be. But if I couldn't figure out the perfect list for that, I'd probably end up playing Loki, right? And I think that that is just a very powerful, powerful thing to to be leveraging and to have a card coming out that makes that deck better. It's just like, whoo! Well, let's see how that turns out. Of course, I've been Cam Best. Thank you so much for watching. As always, you have been phenomenal. Remember to like and subscribe on this extra long episode of the tier list. I will see you in the next one.